We will now consider Romans chapters 10 through 12 in this continuation of this block of Come Follow Me. Romans 10, how faith and salvation come. Romans 10, 1 through 4, Christ is the end of the law. Although the saints in Rome were often rejected by the Jews, we learn that Paul continued to love and respect the Jews and had concern for their salvation, Romans 10, 1 through 3. He said that many Jews went about to establish their own righteousness, which meant that they were zealously striving to establish their own righteousness according to Jewish standards. They did not submit themselves to the righteousness of God, which was the gospel of Jesus Christ. They rejected the gospel that could have ultimately led them to true righteousness. Same as the Savior said in Doctrine and Covenants 1, 13 through 16. I'm sorry for that typographical error there. We, in the latter days, have made the same mistake as the Jews. Dr. Covenants 1, 13 through 16 says, And the anger of the Lord is kindled, and his sword is bathed in heaven, and it fall upon the heavens of the earth, and the arm of the Lord shall be revealed. And the day cometh that they who will not hear the voice of the Lord, neither the voice of the servants, neither give heed to the words of the prophets and apostles, shall be cut off from among the people. For they have strayed from mine ordinances, and they have broken my everlasting covenants. They seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way. See how that is similar to what Paul is saying the Jews were trying to establish their own righteousness. Finishing the quote, And after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world, and whose substance is that of an idol, which waxeth old and shall perish in Babylon, even Babylon the great, which shall fall. The word end in Romans 10.4 can mean conclusion or fulfillment, or it can mean an ultimate purpose or anticipated object. The performances of the law of Moses anticipated the Savior and his atonement, which represented the end of the law. Romans 10, 4 through 13. It's confessing belief in Christ all one must do to be saved. Some Christians have used Paul's words in Romans 10, 9 to claim that all a person must do to be saved is to verbally confess a belief in Jesus Christ. However, in other passages, Paul taught that repentance, baptism, receiving the Holy Ghost, and striving to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ are all essential. Acts 16, 30 through 33, Romans 6, 1 through 11, Galatians 3, 26 through 27, confirms that. In Romans 10, 4 through 13, Paul's purpose was not to give comprehensive description of the process of salvation. Instead, Paul is supporting the point that he stated in verse 4. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Paul quoted Deuteronomy 30, 12-14 to make the point that one need not ascend into heaven or descend into the deep to find Christ. Romans 10, 6-7. Instead, all people, whether Jew or Greek, can find the Savior within their own hearts as they confess that he is the Savior and have faith in him. President Dallin H. Oaks, the First Presidency, affirmed the requirements of salvation. Relying upon the totality of Bible teachings and upon clarifications received through modern revelation, we testify that being cleansed from sin through Christ's atonement is conditioned upon the individual sinner's faith, which must be manifested by obedience to the Lord's command to repent, be baptized, and receive the Holy Ghost. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Jesus taught, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, 
he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Believers who have had this required rebirth at the hands of those having authority have already been saved from sin conditionally. But they will not be saved finally until they have completed their mortal probation with the required continuing repentance, faithfulness, service, and enduring to the end. Romans 10.7 Israel, by God's grace, was elected to receive the blessings and glories of true religion, not by any works done in this life, but by grace alone, as far as this life is concerned, all because of pre-existence and the law of foreordination. But unhappily, only a few, those with special spiritual talents, were in fact receiving the blessings in Paul's day. Romans 10, 8-10 and now, as though the point had not been driven home to the full, Paul calls upon Isaiah and David, paraphrasing their prophecies as his custom was, to testify that Israel should sleep and slumber spiritually with that which should have been their welfare becoming a trap to them. So, have, using the law of Moses to awaken them to Christ in his atonement and coming unto him, they slumbered and slept and missed the whole point. Romans 10, 11-13 Whether Jew or Gentile, Christ is the same Lord over all, and all who are not ashamed of Christ and call upon his name shall be saved. Romans, 14, Romans 10, 14-15 Preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings. Elder Quentin L. Cook of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught how Paul's words found in Romans 10, 14 through 15 emphasize the importance of sharing the gospel. Many wonderful church members are in camouflage to their neighbors or co-workers. They do not let people know who they are and what they believe. We need much more member involvement in sharing the message of the rest <clears throat> restoration. Romans 10 verse 14 puts this into perspective. How then shall they call on him, speaking of the Savior, in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Verse 15 contains a wonderful message referenced in Isaiah. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings. Isaiah 52 7. It has been observed that the members are going to have to do more, are going to have to move their feet and let their ver voices be heard if they are to achieve this blessing. Romans 10, 17. Joseph Smith said, Faith comes by hearing the word of God through the testimony of the servants of God. That testimony is always attended by the spirit of prophecy and revelation. In other words, faith follows preaching when one, the true gospel is taught, two, those who taught it are legal administrators who have been sent of God, three, they teach by the power of the Spirit, so their preaching is attended by the spirit of prophecy and revelation, and four, those who hear the message receive the gifts of the Spirit, for the promise is that signs always and have and always have and always will accompany belief in the same gospel preached by Jesus and his apostles of old. You can see Mark 16, 15 through 18 on that. Elder Robert D. Hells of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. The first step to finding faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is to let his word, spoken by the mouth of his servants, the prophets, touch your hearts. But it is not enough merely to let those words wash over you as if they alone could transform you. We must do our part. Or, as the Savior himself said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, hearing requires an active effort. It means taking seriously what is taught considering it carefully, studying it out in our minds, as the prophet Enos learned. It means letting others' testimonies of the gospel sink deep into our hearts. 
Romans 10, 19-21 Did not ancient Israel know and keep the statutes and judgments of God? Some did, others did not. Thus the Lord, by the mouth of Moses, said such things as, They are a very forward generation, children in whom is no faith, and hence the blessing shall go to other nations, who shall consequently provoke Israel to anger and jealousy. That's Deuteronomy 32, 20-21 Isaiah speaks of the same thing. Paul explains, saying even more plainly than Moses, that because Israel was a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good, that the Lord would then be found and accepted by other people, the Gentiles, who had not previously known him. Isaiah 65, 1 through 2. Romans 11. Israel chosen according to the election of grace. Romans 11, 1 through 7, a remnant of Israel. Even though many Jews did not accept Jesus as their Savior, Paul pointed out that God had not cast away his chosen people. As evidence of this, Paul pointed out that he himself was of the house of Israel. Romans 11, 1. Paul went on to explain that in the time of ancient Israel, some people accepted God while others did not. He quoted an Old Testament account describing Elijah's despair over the wickedness of Israel's people, many of whom had turned to worshiping false gods such as Baal. Elijah believed that he was the only righteous Israelite remaining. However, God told him, I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed to Baal. That's 1 Kings 19, 14 through 18, as Paul is, is trying to explain in Romans 11, 2 through 4. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, as in the days of Elijah, so in the day of Paul, a few of Israel, a few of those foreordained and elected to receive the blessings of God in this life, a remnant of a once great nation had remained faithful and true. The faithful remnants of Israel in Paul's day were those Jews who, like him, had accepted Christ as the long-promised Messiah. So there were a few. There were a remnant. Romans 11, 8 through 11. Paul used quotes from Deuteronomy 39.4 and Psalm 69, uh, 22 or... 23, I apologize for the typo there, to support his point that Israel has rejected God and not the other way around. Romans 11, 11 through 32, God's plan for the eventual salvation of Israel. Paul maintained that Israel had not fallen permanently, and he taught that Israel would experience a further fullness of salvation. See Romans 11, 11 through 12. It contrasts to the smaller remnant of Jewish converts in Paul's day. Many Book of Mormon prophecies also speak of the Lord's plan for Israel's eventual salvation. For example, Nephi declared, Those who are of the house of Israel shall be brought out of obscurity and out of darkness, and they shall know the Lord as their Savior and their Redeemer, the Mighty One of Israel. 1 Nephi 22, 11-12 Jesus taught the Nephites that the restoration of the church in the latter days, including the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, was part of the Lord's plan to gather and redeem Israel. It was to be a sign to the world that fulfillment of his promises had commenced. 3 Nephi 21, 1-7. Romans 13, 11-13. 13. I magnify mine office. In his special role as the Apostle of the Gentiles, Paul directed the next part of his discourse to Gentile converts, as he felt a great responsibility to magnify his office. Romans 11.13 President Thomas S. Monson taught, What does it mean to magnify a calling? It means to build it up in dignity and importance, to make it honorable, commendable, in the eyes of all men, to enlarge and strengthen it, to let the light of heaven shine through it to the view of other men. And how does one magnify a calling? simply by performing the service that pertains to it. An elder magnifies the ordinance, or magnifies the ordained calling of an elder 
by learning what his duties are as an elder are and them by doing them. As with an elder, so with a deacon, a teacher, a priest, a bishop, and each who holds an office in the priesthood. Romans 11.16 Israel cast off forever. No. Though she has fallen, the salvation has gone and said to the Gentiles, in the last day Israel shall return as though from the dead. In the meantime, Paul, through his mission, though his mission is to the Gentiles, will strive to get Israel to emulate the Gentiles that he might perchance save some of them. If the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy meaning Paul here refers to the heave offering in which Israel offered a cake of dough made of the first fruits of the harvest, Numbers 15, 17-21. As this offering of a single cake signified that the whole harvest was hallowed, so the ancient separation of Jews from all, among all people as an offering to God now hallowed all people for the receipt of the truth. Romans eleven sixteen through twenty four analogy of the olive tree, in Romans eleven sixteen through twenty four Paul taught about the branches that had been grafted in to an olive tree, referring to Gentiles who were adopted into the house of Rome. Uh, I'm sorry, into the house of Israel. See Romans eleven seventeen nineteen twenty three through twenty four. The natural olive tree is Israel, while the wild branches are the Gentiles. The Gentiles, the wild branches, are grafted into the house of Israel, the tame tree, and became part of Israel. This analogy from agriculture describes a process that was contrary to nature. For in the natural world, grafted branches control the destiny of the tree. A branch from a tame tree that is grafted into a wild tree makes the wild tree become tame. Paul describes the process of wild branches being grafted into a tame tree with the tree remaining tame. Paul used the analogy in this way, not out of ignorance, but to make a point. The conversion of the Gentiles did not change the destiny of the house of Israel, for the house of Israel is of great importance in the kingdom of God. Even though the gospel was being taken to the Gentiles during Paul's ministry, Israel was still the chosen family and the guardian of the Abrahamic covenant. To catch the full vision of Paul's comments about the tame and wild olive trees, Paul's readers must have had the equivalent of the knowledge found in Zenos's allegory. And indeed, that account itself speaks of the latter-day grafting in of the natural branches again. Let us take of the branches of these which I have planted in the nethermost parts of the vineyard, Zenos records, and let us graft them into the tree from whence they came, and let us pluck from the tree the branches whose fruit is most bitter, and graft in the natural branches of the tree in the stead thereof. Jacob 5.52 Romans 11, verses 18-21 through 21 and verses 30-31 through 31. Gentile Christians were to be humble and merciful to Jews. Paul warned Gentile members of the church to be not high-minded. He admonished them to be humble and faithful, not to think they were better than Jews who had not embraced the gospel. Romans 11, 18-20 Paul explained that by showing mercy and kindness to the Jewish people, Gentile Christians could prepare the way for Jews to eventually embrace the gospel and receive the Lord's mercy, Romans 11, 30-31. If the Gentile mem members were prideful, they would suffer the same fate as the unrepentant Jews and be cut off from God's kingdom. This warning, to not be high-minded or prideful, should be heeded by all people who love the Lord and desire to return to God's presence. History shows that latter Gentile Christians later failed to follow Paul's counsel and became hostile toward Jews. In later centuries, after Christians became a majority with political power, the rise of hateful anti-Jewish rhetoric among them led to violence against the Jews. This is a great teaching that applies to us today to think that we are of God's 
living, true and only living church, that somehow that makes us better than others. And that we can then cause offense to non-members because of our self-righteousness. The Book of Mormon pre prophet Nephi wrote, O ye Gentiles, have you remembered the Jews, my ancient covenant, pe covenant people? Nay, but ye have cursed them, ye have hated them, and have not sought to recover them. But behold, I, the Lord, have not forgotten my people, and I will show unto them that fight against my word and against my people, who are of the house of Israel, that I am God, and that I come with Abraham, that I would remember his seed forever. Second Nephi 29, verses 5 and 14. Romans 11, verse 25, the fullness of the Gentiles. Eventually, every living soul shall hear the message of salvation. For verily the voice of the Lord is unto all men, and there is none to escape. And there is no eye that shall not see, neither ear that shall not hear, neither heart that shall not be penetrated. Doctrine and Covenants 1, verse 2. But gospel truths go to those of various nations on the earth on a priority basis. Whole races and nations of men shall first hear the word in the spirit world. Others shall have the testimony of Christ born to them while here in mortality. For the nearly 2,000 years between Abraham and Christ, the statutes and judgments of God were reserved almost exclusively for the seed of Abraham and for the house of Israel. During the mortal ministry of our Lord, the message was limited to Israel, to the Jews, and it was not then offered to the Gentiles. After Jesus' resurrection, Peter opened the door to the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles, and Paul became their chief apostolic advocate and teacher. This, there was a period of time appointed for the Jews to hear the word, and then a period of time for the Gentiles to take precedence. The time of the Gentiles is the period during which the gospel goes to them on a preferential basis, and this will continue until they have a full opportunity to accept the truth, or in other words, until the fullness of the Gentiles. Then the message will go again to the Jews, meaning to the Jews as a nation, as a people. So we are still in the time of the Gentiles. We have not reached the fullness of the Gentiles yet. Jesus said that the Jews would be scattered among all nations, which is the now existing situation. But they shall be gathered again, he continued, but they shall remain until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And when the times of the Gentiles has come in, a light shall break forth among them that sit in darkness, and it shall be the fullness of my gospel. But they receive it not, for they perceive not the light, and they turn their hearts from me because of the precepts of men. And in that generation shall the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Doctrine and Covenants 45, verses 19, 25, 28 through 30. Romans chapter 11, verses 26 to 27. Salvation will come again to the Jew as a nation at the second coming. The day when the deliverer comes again, the day when the times of the Gentile is fulfilled. Then he will take away their sins, and they again shall be his people as in days of old. Romans 11, 28 through 32. Because the Jews as a nation rejected the gospel in Paul's day, it was taken to the Gentiles. Because the Gentiles as a whole shall reject the gospel in this day, it shall be taken again to the Jews when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Romans 11.29 The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. God bestows gifts and grace upon men and calls them to his Holy Ghost without reference to any achievements or preparations on their part as far as this life is concerned. Men are called, elected, called, foreordained, all on the basis of pre-existent preparation. Thus Joseph Smith was called to stand as one of the mightiest prophets of the ages, called as it were without repentance, that is, he had not received the gospel, he had not established himself as a leader of power and influence, he was called rather according to the foreknowledge of God because of the talents, capacities earned in pre-mortal life. Remember, in age 
14, he is called. And then he learns of the gospel and repentance and the ordinances. Romans 11:33. Great is his wisdom. Marvelous are his ways and the extent of his doings. None can find out. Doctrine and Covenants 76, 2. Romans 11:36. By him and through him and of him the word, worlds are and were created. Doctrine and Covenants 76, 24. Let's go now to Romans chapter 12. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Romans 12, 1 through 2, two, one through two represent your bodies a living sacrifice. Sacrifices are of two kinds, living and dead, or in other words, temporal and spiritual. Under the law of Moses, animals were slain in the similitude of the coming sacrifice of the Son of God. Such were temporal sacrifices, sacrifices involving death. But under the law of Christ, men are called upon to make living sacrifices, to sacrifice themselves by obedience to the laws and ordinance of the gospel, or in other words, submitting our will to the will of God. Paul is here alluding to the fact that the old sacrifices, those unto death are abolished, that they have been replaced with a new order, sacrifices unto life. As with almost all doctrine, this is taught in the Book of Mormon with greater plainness and perfection than in the Bible. To the Nephites, after his resur resurrection, the Lord said, Ye shall offer up unto, unto me no more the shedding of blood. Yea, your sacrifices and your burnt offerings shall be done away. For I will accept none of your sacrifices and your burnt offerings. And ye shall offer for a sacrifice unto me a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And whoso cometh unto me with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, him will I baptize with fire and with the Holy Ghost. 3 Nephi 9, 19-20 Thus, to present one's body as a living sacrifice is to come forth with a broken heart and a contrite spirit through obedience. Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught, As our body is the instrument of our spirit, it is vital that we care for it as best we can. We should consecrate its powers to serve and further the work of Christ. Said Paul, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Romans 12.1 when Paul spoke of giving our bodies as a living sacrifice, he drew a parallel to the Old Testament practice of ani sacrificing animals. President Russell M. Nelson taught, We are still commanded to sacrifice, not, but not by shedding blood of animals. Our highest sense of sacrifice is achieved as we make ourselves more sacred or holy. This we do by our obedience to the commandments of God. Thus the laws of obedience and sacrifice are indebitably intertwined. As we comply with these and other commandments, something wonderful happens to us. We become disciplined. We become disciples. We become more sacred and holy like our Lord. The word holy in Hebrew means to be separated or to be separate but not just separated about something, but separated for a specific purpose or reason. So we are becoming holy when we decide to separate ourselves from the world for the holy reason of becoming like Christ and becoming exalted. That is when we become holy. We separate for a specific purpose, and that purpose is to become like God. Romans 12, 3 and 16. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Paul counseled church members not to be haughty or to think too highly of themselves, but to associate with people of all social ranks. Romans 12, 3, 16. Sister Ann M. Dibb, who served as members of the Young Women General Presidency and who is the daughter of President Thomas S. Monson, spoke of how her father exemplifies this ideal. 
My father's friend comes from all walks. My father's friends come from all walks of life. I'd like to tell you about one of my father's friends who would have been considered by others to be one of the least of these my brethren. His name was Ed Erickson. He was almost 20 years old than my father. Ed was born prematurely and experienced some of the complications that accompany premature births almost a century ago. Ed couldn't see very well, and he never had the opportunity to study and learn at a university. My father was a loyal friend and actively sought to find ways for Ed to feel valued. Dad frequently hired Ed to help him clean his pigeon coops and do manual chores in our large yard. He was a big man, he looked different, and he didn't talk very much. Ed just did his work, ate dinner with us, and then Dad would take him home. This happened several times each year. In later years, when my father would get tickets to take his grandchildren to the circus or to the rodeo, Ed always came too, sharing our popcorn and drinks. Ed passed away three years ago at the age of 96. If you had attended <clears throat> Ed's funeral, you would have thought it was the funeral of one of the greatest individuals who had ever lived. And actually, it was. It was the funeral for my father's lifelong friend, Ed Erickson. <clears throat> Excuse me. Romans 12.2 We are to submit our will to God instead of conforming to the will of the world, thus coming to know the mind of God and that which is good, acceptable, and perfect in this fallen world. Romans 12, verses 4 through 11, we are, all, we are to all be one and unified as members of Christ's church. Paul compares the unity we are to have in the church. I say unto you, be one, and if you are not one, you are not mine. Doctrine and Covenants 38, 27. To how a body has different members, arms, legs, head, and etc., Though there are many members in the church with different spiritual gifts, we are to become one body using the different gifts of the Spirit God had given us to become one in love, affection, brotherly love, fervent in spirit, hope, serving the Lord, patient, and hospitality. Romans 12, 9-21, Paul's counsel to church members. Much as the Savior did in the Sermon on the Mount, Paul provided counsel to church members and taught them many principles about living a Christian life. Romans 12, 9-21 contained verse after verse of such teachings. Love without dissimulation is love without hypocrisy. It is love unfeigned. Romans 12, 9 Paul's counsel to mind not high things but Condescend to men of low state, Romans 12, 16, is reminiscent of the Savior's exhortation in Matthew 5, 46, 47, to be kind even to the publicans, those who were despised. Paul's words in Romans 12, 14 through 15 and 21, have counterparts in Matthew 5, 44, Mosaic 18, 9, and Doctrine and Covenants 42, verse 45. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.